Hello, lovely readers. My name is Marlena Frank, and I'm a YA fantasy and horror author. Today I'm picking up where we left off on our Scrivener tutorial series. I had to take a hiatus from doing these for a while because I've just been so busy. You've probably seen the videos from our events that we've been going to, like when we went up to BookCon up in New York City. I've also been working on edits for multiple books, so I'm pretty swamped right now. But I really wanted to dig more into these features in Scrivener because I've heard how many people have really enjoyed these tutorials and found them useful. So if you've been following along in my Scrivener tutorial playlist, this is part four and we'll be covering how to use the inspector. Now, I'm not sponsored for any of these Scrivener tutorials. I just really like using the software. It's really made writing books so much easier for me, especially since I used to use Word all the time. Today, we'll talk about using the features of the inspector, which include the synopsis, notes, labels, statuses, and document references. So let's get started. So I've opened up the sample Scrivener file that we've been working on throughout this tutorial series. When I talk about the inspector, I'm talking about this big blue eye in the top right with a circle around it. This toggles on this right side menu you see here. You'll see icons along the top that include items like backup snapshots, which we covered in tutorial number three. There are also a bunch of other icons. From left to right, you'll see Notes, References, Keywords, Custom Metadata, Snapshots, and Footnotes and Comments. Let's start with the Notes section. The synopsis at the top of the Notes section coincides with the synopsis used on the note cards. So the data you see here will be reflected in the note card for this scene on the cork board. So if you outline with the note cards in Scrivener, it will automatically populate the synopsis on the inspector. Under General Metadata, you'll see labels listed. This can be helpful for color coordinating your scenes, whether in outlines or in the binder on the left hand side. So let's see how to do that. Click on the drop down. So you have some pre populated labels, but you want to have one specific for the draft that you're working on. This is a handy way to see how many scenes you have to edit still. So let's add another label. Click on Edit. Click on the plus sign at the bottom to add a label. Type in the name of your label and hit Enter. Then double click the color icon beside it to choose what color to use. Let's choose this light purple color. Now click OK. So the new label has been created. Let's assign the draft one label to this scene. Now let's get the color coding turned on. Go to view, use label color in, and then choose binder. You can also choose to use the label color in the index cards. So you'll notice this scene synopsis turned a light purple color. This makes sense since this synopsis reflects the index card. And when you switch to the cork board, you'll see the light purple color showed there too now. And this hopefully gives you some great ideas on how useful labels can be. I've used them to keep track of drafts, to keep track of scenes I need to tackle, or to keep track of scenes I want to exclude from the final product. Now let's take a look at statuses. Let's open a different scene and try creating a new status. Click on the status drop down and go to edit. We'll add a status for finished edits. Same as before, we can click on the plus sign to add a status type in the name, and then click Enter. Then click OK. Now we'll assign the finished edit status to this scene. 
Now when you open the cork board for this chapter, you'll see that this scene shows finished edits written across it like a stamp. This is really helpful during outlining when you're not really ready for color coordination, but you do need to keep track of things for your scenes, such as a draft stage, maybe character perspectives, or even locations. So let's go back to scene three and look at notes. By default, you'll see document notes at the bottom in yellow. These notes are linked to each scene. You can kind of consider them like scratch space. And when I switch to scene one, you won't see any notes in that scene. So a good use for this is to keep track of word counts throughout the day. When I'm working on a project and I tend to open it multiple times during the day, I'll put the new word count into this section. Another good idea is to write down reminders about what you need to work on next time or where you want to go. You'll notice that the document notes menu is also a drop down, so let's click on that and go to project notes. This shows up as a blue color. These notes are persistent throughout your project. So these notes will show up throughout the book that you're working on regardless of what scene you're on or what chapter. A quick note in the general metadata section. You'll see a checkbox for include in compile. This is when you want to compile your book into another format such as Word or PDF. It's usually the last step that you take before you move on to major edits. We'll tackle that though in another video. That's a whole process. The next section are references. Most of this section is the same as the notes section, but at the bottom you'll see document references. These allow you to link directly to other objects in your project. In this example, we'll link to a character file. Click on the plus sign and go to Add Internal Reference, go to Characters, and choose John Doe. Then you can right click on the object to open it in your editor. You'll notice the Document References also has a drop down like the Notes section did. Click on the drop down and go to Project References. Just like the project notes, these project references are persistent for the entire project. In this example, we'll create a reference to a place. Click on the plus sign to add and go to Add Internal Reference, then click on Places, then click on Gazebo. This also allows you to jump to that object in your editor. The next section is for keywords, but since this video is getting pretty long, I'll save that for next time. Keywords are very powerful. Next you'll see custom metadata. I've not used this very much, but it gives you the ability to add metadata to your scenes. These might be attributes that labels or statuses can't really replace. I've heard they're very helpful in recipe books. Next you'll see snapshots, and I covered that in detail in Scrivener Part 3 of my Scrivener tutorial series. These are useful for creating backups of your work. Finally, there is the comments and footnotes section. While I've not used these as much in fiction writing, I've heard they're very useful for nonfiction writers. I think that's it for now. Next time, I'll cover keywords and importing external data into your Scrivener project. So this quote is from my debut novel, Stolen, which is book one of the Stolen series. It's available now in hardback, paperback, and ebook. If you haven't already, please hit that thumbs up button and make sure you subscribe. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a comment and let me know. I love hearing what you all think, and if there's a specific feature you want me to tackle, just let me know. You can watch the full series of these videos in my Scrivener Tutorials playlist, available on my channel page. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next week. Happy writing!